Hello and welcome to Software Group's Digital Finance Deep Dive. In this webinar series, we are engaging with digital finance experts across the globe to share their industry insights and experience in digital finance, digital transformation, and digital innovation, highlighting success stories and relevant case studies in financial inclusion. My name is Charlene Bachman. I'm the Director of Customer Success at Software Group. Software Group is a global technology company specialized in digital and integration solutions for organizations that provide financial services. We help financial service providers successfully go through the process of digital transformation, extend their outreach, and improve operational efficiency. Software Group is committed to financial inclusion, innovating for a global economy that includes everyone. We also value the knowledge and insights that we gain in supporting digital transformation and in our interactions with industry thought leaders. We hope this initiative can serve as a platform for knowledge exchange within the software group community. Today's special guest is Mr. Ayaz Mitha. Welcome, Ayaz. Thanks, Charlene. Just a quick intro, I guess, for you. Um, Ayaz is an internationally renowned digital finance expert fintech entrepreneur and investor. He's led digital transformation projects across more than 40 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And he served as an advisor to a wide range of international organizations such as the World Bank, IFC, CGAP, MasterCard Foundation, AFD, and he's currently supporting an innovation acceleration program with UNCDF that has a strong focus on the development of digital economies. This is a, we'd like to give you a warm welcome, Ayaz. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I know you have a, a very busy schedule um, and we're really looking forward to hearing about your perspective on you know, the development of innov digital innovation in the emerging markets and the experience that you've had over, over, the, over the years working in this field. Thank you very much. It's also my pleasure and thanks for inviting me and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to an exciting and stimulating conversation. Great. Now, before we begin, just a, a bit of housekeeping. We wanted to make sure that everyone knows how to submit the, the burning questions that are going to come up throughout our conversation. So from the go to webinar menu, select the questions box and type your questions directly in the text box to submit. And um, you're welcome to submit your questions throughout the, the session as they arise. And we're going to reserve the last 15 minutes or so to discuss the questions that are submitted. Now, um, if we can dive into the questions that, that we've prepared for, for Ayaz, um, I, I, the, I guess the, the best place to start is really how you have found yourself working in this digital finance space and, um, and you know, just a brief history of, of your early onset into this field. Yeah, so um, I think it was actually all by chance, uh, or by good fortune, maybe I should say. Um, it was back in 2006 when I was actually running a digital uh, strategy consulting company out of Dubai as part of the management team. And after two years of uh, grueling work in, in the region, I decided to resign and do something that I found to be a bit more meaningful for myself. And I decided to join the leading mobile operator in Afghanistan, uh, which is called Roshan. And you may not be familiar with Roshan, but I think one of the things that um, really attracted me to them was their social ethos. Uh, and you see, it was not your average um, mobile operator business. It was actually a mobile operator that was providing um, infrastructure, economic opportunities, employment opportunities, um, and also driving a range of social impact projects in a country that was in conflict. And I felt like there's probably something, given my experience in the telecommunication space and in financial services and in consulting as well, as I was running that consulting firm that could, could be helpful there. So I decided to join them. And one of the first projects that, has, that I was actually in charge of and that I directed was M-Pesa. And again, you may not be necessarily all very familiar with M-Pesa, but that's the equivalent of the Kenyan M-Pesa that everybody knows. Uh, the platform was designed exactly at the same time. We used the same uh, Vodafone Group technology um, as a Vodafone partner, and we were actually competing with the Kenyan M-Pesa in the design of the platform in, in, in the sense that in Kenya it was more of a P2P sort of uh, transfer business model and functionality that they wanted on the platform. In our case, we were more about uh, government uh, payroll disbursement and, and digital microfinance, if you would like. So we were designing everything at the same time. 
and we launched uh, the platform and the service in the country in 2008. And when we launched, it was just immediately after M-Pesa had launched in Kenya, I became sort of uh, perceived as one of the early experts in the field. Um, and, and that field that we used to call mobile money, and now we are probably calling it sort of digital finance. Um, and that's what got me into the, into the space. And so from 2008 until now, I've been working on multiple projects in different capacities in different parts of the world. But it all started there um, as an adventure uh, looking for social impact in, in Central Asia. So that's how it started. That's very inspiring. I think um, I think you have had a great impact in a number of the organizations that you've been able to to work in over the years since that time and 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 been able to transfer a lot of the learnings that you've had um, into the different organizations that you've been working with. Um, I guess in, when we talk about what you know technology is having an impact, um, which you know, in mobile money, I'm, I'm sure you know we we can all agree has has definitely um, been had a huge impact um, in in financial inclusion. But um, you know, which technology do you think has had the greatest impact in financial inclusion? Would it be mobile money, um, and, and what you know, what has now become digital financial services, or is there you know a specific technology that you'd say has been really the catalyst for financial inclusion? So yeah, you know, at the risk of um, stating the obvious, um, yeah. I would say that in terms of democrat democratizing access, um, certainly uh, mobile phone and mobile money and the mobile phone as, as you know, as in GSM technology has had the greatest impact. I mean, if we, if we look at where we are today, we have 5 billion unique GSM subscriptions um, around the world, and that's probably 67% of the global population, uh, which means pretty much everyone is, is connected to GSM now. And since 2017, if I recall properly, uh, we passed the threshold of more than half of the world population also having access to internet and really being mobile first in the way they access the internet. So that's undeniably had huge impact, and it's had impact in two ways. Uh, one, it's enabled traditional financial service providers to expand their outreach, uh, in a sense, and their footprint beyond traditional branches at capital costs and operating costs that are far cheaper than the traditional way. So instead of spending $250,000 in building a bank branch, now you're spending $1,000 in signing up an agent and equipping that agent with connected technology. And instead of spending $4 per transaction as a bank for that transaction to be serviced in your branch, uh, you're now giving a uh, 50 cents commission to, a, to an agent. So that, that translates into significant cost reduction and it's been a game changer in a way. And, and so you've seen a range of countries where uh, agents have proliferated, uh, you know, from Brazil with 150,000 agents in Brazil today uh, to Kenya, for instance, that has about 120,000 and PESA agents to China that has around, I think, um, a million agents. And, and that's really changed the landscape completely. I mean, you look at Kenya alone, the number of agents is probably 40 times the number of ATMs in, in the country. And so that's really democratized access. And as a result, you've seen branches banking, mobile money as well flourishing. And you know, if you look at the latest GSMA statistics, and I was showing that at my class at Boulder Institute of Microfinance this summer, and numbers may have changed since, but it was 900 million accounts that had been opened on, on mobile money. Uh, and of course, there's, there's challenges around activity levels, which are in the range of 30%, which means we don't necessarily have all the services that people want, but at least now we have the digital rails um, over which we can build more products. So I would say that's probably the first technology that I can think of that's really been changing the landscape. Um, there, there's probably another two that I can speak to very briefly. Uh, one of them is machine learning, obviously, and, and we know all the craze about you know, digital lending and nano credits uh, in all regions, in fact, not just in Africa, but Asia, and, and now to a certain extent in Latin America as well. Um, and I would say that although the outcome is debatable and there's healthy questioning right now in the industry in terms of how responsible nano credit really is, and whether it's harming people or it's helping people. And, and these are the right questions to ask, but I can also tell you that it does make a difference in people's lives and bring services that are needed. And I was running a, a digital lending business, an annual credit business in Africa actually for four years that I built from scratch with my team members. 
Uh, and by the way, if any one of them is listening in right now, I want to tell them how fortunate I was to work with them and, and how great of a time I've had with them. But coming back to my point, it's been helping people in all the markets where we launched. And I think it, there's a healthy debate to be had in terms of whether it's really helping and how it can be improved and whether it can provide a stepping stone towards the formal financial system, which is the ultimate goal of financial inclusion. Can it be more responsible? Can it provide more financial wellness? These are constructive questions to ask. But I think in many ways, machine learning today is also really affecting and changing the financial inclusion landscape. And then probably referring to one of the recent projects I've been working on with MTN across Africa, I would say open APIs is also taking things to the next level now more and more. And there's a larger and larger number of DFS, uh, digital financial services providers, that are shifting towards an open API-based model, uh, which is really enabling innovators to build meaningful services that will benefit consumers, uh, but digital financial services providers themselves, and these innovators all together. And I think this is what's allowing us now to maximize the utilization of the digital rails that we have established to drive new business models above these rails across industries so that now digital finance can have impacts in renewable energy, in access to healthcare, access to education, access to transportation services, agri-financing, um, and, and many other areas. Um, and we see that already in our day-to-day -day life, right? We see a lot of new pay-as-you-go models emerging that provide financial products links to assets in the case of solar portable solar kits, for instance, or, or say usage-based car insurance. So all of these are enabled because of the digital rails and open APIs are accelerating this. And I think when I think of technologies that really have impact in the digital finance space, um, machine learning and open APIs are the next wave of technologies that are really changing and affecting the landscape. Very interesting. I mean, especially, you know, thinking about all the different business models that have come from mobile, as you noted, you know, the over-the-counter and self-service and, and kind of giving us, a, you know, a, an idea of what's to come because it, there is some progress already made in terms of machine learning and OPI, open APIs, but, you know, the, um, the opportunity that those those technologies present, I think, is is yet to be you know fully seen, and there's going to be a lot more development and innovation happening there. Um, so I guess to bring us back to the you know kind of more the mobile money space and and in your experience um, there and and what you learned in those early days, um, do you have you know the three maybe key lessons that you have taken from that your you know your time working. Um, in Afghanistan, starting in Paisa, um, what what were those three lessons learned that you are kind of have been able to transfer um, and and share with the other organizations that you've been working with since that time? So I, I think you know um, it's always difficult to talk about key lessons um, that you need to extract because there are so many lessons and so many things you learn and they're so context specific in some cases. But the way I like to um, to look at the mobile money business, just like any financial service business, in fact, is that you really have three pieces. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it comprises of a distribution business, which is sort of the, the retail distribution piece. There's a processing business, which is basically your, your middle office and linking your, your front end to your back end. And you have the manufacturing product design piece, which is the back end. And so it's really a combination of a, of a manufacturing business where you have your data repository, your backend system, and your, your product innovation. You have your processing piece, as I just mentioned, and distribution. And I think distribution is still really essential and is still required in most countries. Um, in fact, you have many countries that are still mostly over-the-counter OTC, like in Pakistan and Bangladesh, where, where I've done a lot of work with the largest sort of branches, banking providers and mobile money providers there. Uh, it's very much uh, transaction driven over the counter at the agent location. And so distribution remains a key piece of digital finance. And if you don't get that piece right, uh, you're very likely to fail. And so I worked on, on a number of projects uh, in Indonesia, in Uganda, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in West Africa, where you know, the, the agent model was not sustainable and sufficient attention had not been given to agent economics. And then when that happens, 
it really becomes very hard because your value proposition to customers uh, is going down the drain and it's really difficult to make sort of the tough decisions and, and rip your agent network apart and rebuild it from scratch. And, and I've actually done that with a few providers in Uganda and Nigeria, for instance, where we said, hey, let's scale this agent network down to sort of the minimum viable platform with agents uh, you know, processing transactions above a certain threshold and let's rebuild it in a much healthier way to ensure that you know your agents are happy, your customers are happy. So I would say the first thing is pay a lot of attention to distribution because it's at the heart of what you're going to be delivering and it's, it's super critical. I think the second piece probably is around partnerships. Um, in this digital age, there's no way you can control the entire value chain um, in, in, in a vertically integrated fashion, if you would like. And, and so you need to open up your systems, you need to open up your platform so that others and innovators can actually come and easily integrate with you, consume your assets and services and build on top of them so that they can enrich your value proposition to your own customers. Uh, we are actually co-creating and, and not competing anymore. And, and as I was mentioning to you, I've been working on that open API project with MTN, and not just in Uganda, but across the, the African region. And I'm doing some other open API projects in Asia as well. Uh, and that's a project that was um, designed in, in partnership with CGAP. Um, and I can assure you that the way they're seeing themselves in the ecosystem right now and the way they're opening up their APIs is, is allowing them to bring thousands of developers to come on top of their platform and start creating exciting products for the market. And in Uganda, within less than a year, we have over a thousand developers that have signed up and that are now building creative products and solutions over the mobile money platform that's available there. So if you want to have that multiplier effect of, of people bringing in exciting new services that are going to add value to your customers, then, then partnerships are essential. And, and thinking of an open environment is what's going to allow you to scale. And maybe the last thing I want to say is, in all of this, it's always super healthy to have a conversation with regulators early on and bring them on board. And you know, going back to what I was mentioning before, that nano lending fintech business that I was running across Africa and, and Asia and Latin America for four years. Uh, one of the first countries in which we launched was DRC uh, in partnership with the mobile operator and a bank there in, in, in um, you know, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we really went to see the regulator very early on. We discussed the plan with them. We made sure they were part of it and comfortable with it because this was a very relatively new topic when we, when we launched. Um, and it's super important because if there's an issue with the service, if there's an issue with consumer protection at some point, uh, at least you know the regulator is on board and is on your side. Um, and if you're successful, then they're also part of that success. So I think it's really important. Maybe my third advice would be uh, bring regulators on board very, very early on. And I know there's, multi, there's different, you know, varying opinions on this. But I think it's it's always better to have them on your side than uh, rather than antagonizing them. And and you've all heard of the Libra case right now. Everybody's talking about Facebook's Libra. Yeah, um, they, they designed the plan. It's a it's a great plan, fantastic. They put together a whole sort of uh, consortium to support them. But they didn't really bother about getting regulatory approval beforehand before making big announcements. And now they're in trouble. So I think. You know, there's things that we can learn from that as well, but it's important to, to have them uh, on your side early on. Certainly, and I, I think that those are, um, you know, particularly around distribution and, and sorting out the agent economics in the business, that's also something that, that we've seen with our customers and we, we try to reinforce the importance that when you're you know adopting an agency banking solution that it's also it's a new business it's a new um, you actually have to manage your your agents you have to make sure they're incentivized create the whole economy there um, and you know touching on the the partnership um, topic and and I, I think there is going to be a lot more you know innovation happening because of these open apis so it sounds like what you're what you're witnessing in in Uganda um, you know, seeing the replication effect of that, we'll, we'll also see a lot of more innovation and in product development um, yeah, so, as, so as it's adopted know. elsewhere. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I just wanted to react to what you were saying. And one of the projects I'm working on right now uh, with the Central Bank of China is thinking about the agent uh, model of the future. Because, you know, as you okay. know, and, and, and again, going back to agent economics, 
um, it, it's really important to understand agent economics in detail. Um, and, and because the economy there in China in particular is, is in, in the process of rapid digitalization, uh, there's probably less and less over-the-counter transactions. And that raises a lot of questions around how do you make these agents sustainable if there's no over-the-counter transactions anymore and people are really interacting with their smartphones and making all their payments and living their financial lives with their smartphones. Um, what do you do with these agents? Because they're still needed in many communities as the on-ramp to that digital finance space and, and they need that access channel, but you also have to make it sustainable. And so thinking about how that needs to evolve in time as well, uh, because it's not static. You've designed your agent network today, you've thought about agent economics and you've thought that through and it's fine, it's great, it's all working fine. But as your economy starts digitizing, uh, you mm -hmm. need to re-ask yourself that question continuously over time. And that's also super important. Yeah, that's a really interesting case study. I mean, as, especially as, you know, each market is evolving differently. Um, I guess that will be a good segue to the next um, the next question we have is um, where where there's gaps in, in the supply and demand side of, of DFS. Because, you know, as you, you're seeing, the economy is also changing with digitalization that's also going to shift the you know both both the supply and demand side and, and how organizations have the agility yeah. to, to react to that is very key for sure i mean listen one one of the gaps that i uh, on the supply side let's start maybe with the supply side um some of the gaps that i consistently see um are first in technology uh, i think we live now at a digital age um where everything is data driven uh, we often say, you know, data is the new oil and we make all these statements, but in reality, everything is really based on data now. And, and it looks like we are moving away from being sort of intermediators of, of financial transactions to becoming intermediators of, of data. Uh, and if you're not able to structure yourself in a way that really drives proper use of data within your organization to deliver hyper-relevant products to your customers, and by hyper-relevant, I mean products that are personalized always on in a one-to-one -one relationship where you're able to move from a transaction-based model to a relationship-based model with your customer, then you're in trouble. And, and I see a lot of DFS providers that are doing fantastic, but they're still having this legacy technology that becomes really difficult to change. And it becomes really difficult then to leverage data, have access to the right level of data and the granularity of data that you need. Um, just to give you sort of a point of reference, Alibaba is changing their tech platform every four years. And every four years, they rebuild for the next generation because of the needs um, that they have to be able to service not just large volumes, but also process and handle more and more data and richer and richer data as they're capturing. And so by, by 2022, they will be capable of handling a million transactions per second with real-time AI-based AML and fraud, fraud management check on each transaction. Well, that's something that you don't see traditional institutions do. And so the, the big question, we are, we are, you know, I'm not saying we need to reap and replace everything. We can also build and migrate, but at some point we need to accelerate that transition towards the proper technology that we need. So I think that's one, one place where I see there's, there's a lot of gaps in the, in the supply side. I think probably sometimes I also see lack of clear foresight uh, in terms of what you want to become through this digital transformation because we are all undergoing digital transformation whether we call it digital transformation or not and and that leads to some sort of paralysis or inaction and i think it's difficult to embrace completely a new model if you're not clear about where you're going and what you want to be um, and 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 it's even more difficult for mobile money providers because they they have an existing business to run. So for a fintech to become totally digital is easy for a bank or a telco because they're running already an existing business that they need to also look at. Uh, it's a bit more difficult. So I would say building that clear understanding uh, is super important and having a clear direction, uh, and that often comes from from the board and from the management, by the way. And I think also understand the consequences of what we are building. And I see a lot of gaps on the supply side now in, in terms of really understanding the consequences and the impact of what's being built. For instance, you know, we talked about machine learning and there's good sides to it, but there's consequences as well um, because we are creating algorithmic biases that will be potentially penalizing or excluding people or communities or genders. 
And, and I think having that deep understanding of what is it that we are building there is also super important. Uh, on, on the demand side, I would say it's, it's, it's the same thing. You know, it's been 14 years I've been in that space and it's all still about financial literacy and, and wellness. And, and I think it's important because in, again, in this new digital age, you don't want to leave anyone behind. Um, and digital is bringing great opportunities, but it's also bringing a lot of risks. Um, and if people are not equipped with the right knowledge, uh, they don't have the right tools, uh, they're not as affluent, um, they're going to be left behind. And there's a need still in this area. It's not just about financial, basic financial literacy, it's digital literacy, uh, it's data literacy. It's how do I manage that digital platform as a customer so that I can actually take advantage of it and that reduces inequalities and reduces gaps. And so, you know, I see a lot of people getting away with the argument, for instance, when we talk about data, that people are willing to give away their data because they, they value the service and they want to have access, so they're giving away their data and that's all right. Um, I don't think that's right. They don't have a choice. We're not giving them a choice. And I think there's probably a better way to do this. And and. If there's one area where I feel we, we can significantly improve, it's in the financial literacy and digital literacy space when it comes to, to the demand side. And have you seen, like, what have you seen had the be most impact in terms of um, programs or initiatives to address the, the digital literacy um, and financial literacy piece? So, you know, th there's lots of examples and there's lots, lots of fintechs and startups actually in that space trying to, mm -hmm. to, to leverage technology and digital to provide online education, training services. There's been a lot of, in, in Africa, there's been a lot of microfinance driven community uh, platforms to, to enhance financial literacy and, and create financial well-being. So there's, there's a range of initiatives um, that have been implemented. Some are really more leveraging physical platforms and community gatherings and platforms, and that becomes sort of probably a bit more difficult to, to scale. And some of them are leveraging digital. And there's companies like, you know, I don't want to necessarily cite specific companies, but say, for instance, 21CC that provides 21st century online education that's also providing a lot of um, a lot of tools to enhance your your financial literacy digital literacy so there's there's a variety of of programs i think one thing that's important is you're now starting to see large multilateral international organizations like the un for instance really driving a very strong inclusion agenda uh and not just financial inclusion but digital inclusion and there's a range of programs uh, that are being run. And one of the things I've been working on, for instance, is that I'm running now digital innovation accelerators uh, for part of my activity and part of my time with the uh, UN to drive meaningful digital innovation uh, in different areas that are targeted at creating services around financial literacy, creating services around uh, digital literacy. So it's not just about access and credit and SME financing and that kind of stuff, which is also there, but we're also trying to accelerate startup companies that provide creative services and solutions around literacy. Um, so that's super important. And then I would want to say one more thing maybe, is that super platforms, um, because they're also in the landscape. You know, We talk about fintechs and, and telcos and mobile money and banks and microfinance, but it's, it's obvious that super platforms uh, play a critical role in today's world in terms of including people and, and bringing them on board. And I think super platforms really have a responsibility there as well in terms of driving that education and driving inclusion. And you see the likes of um, Ant Financial, for instance, or WeBank in China that take this very seriously. And Ant Financial has implemented a program that drives maybe not just financial literacy, but I would say social responsibility. Um, among their customers in, in very creative ways. So there, there's, there's a multiplicity of things. And, and you know, if people that are, you know, if people that are attending are interested, I can also share afterwards some material that points to some of these experiences. So it sounds like there's, there's plenty of things out there. And, and in terms of where, where the real gaps are, it's um, really trying to figure out how to get the services to, you know, to, to the, the people and how, um, to identify where the gaps are and then make sure that those are 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 being offered to to the right populations who maybe um 
to, to where there is a gap, right? I mean, that's where what we kind of need to see is it sounds like there's a lot of innovation out there, but how do we get it to the people who need it the most? Yeah. And it has to be an ecosystem approach uh, right. because I, I, we we cannot expect private sector players and and DFS providers to do all the heavy lifting on their own. Um, they they have a business to run and they have their economics to to also uh, support. And so it's going to be difficult for them to to do everything. But you know, there's a lot of international organizations that are also involved. Uh, some of the super platforms are involved, so you can find other partners that, that can support that agenda and to help scale it. And, and it can be done in very creative ways. Cool. I guess, I guess that, that um, in terms of kind of the next question is, you know, you, we we're talking about a lot of organizations who, you know, need, um, who, who are trying to figure out exactly what they want to do with digital transformation, what they want to become. What would be your, your advice for them then as they're going through this digital transformation journey? Um, how how do they prepare for that, and how do they, you know, a, a address that the challenge you 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 just mentioned of um, maybe lacking yeah. that that clear foresight? So so I think the first thing is is probably to have that strategic view and build a strategic view of of where you want to be and and define that vision very clearly because digital transformation is is not a project it's not one of the projects that we we do it's it's actually redefining who you want to be as a provider and what you want to become um, and have that that definition and that vision of, of where you're going and where you're headed very clear, not just at the executive level, but also uh, throughout the organization. Uh, and then when you have that clear, you can actually build the path and define the path you want to follow. So I would say the first thing is really to do that. And if you're not able to do that internally because you may not have the resources or the, the skills, uh, because that raises a lot of questions and it's a very complex issue, then then get some help. Uh, one of the things uh, I, I also like to suggest sometimes is, uh, you know, you need to have someone in your board that, that has that hat. You need to have a digital transformation expert uh, of some sort on the board as well. If you have a board made of traditional uh, bankers or traditional financial services providers, um, you know, how much are they going to know about all these different aspects of digital? So I think it's really important to 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 think about everything from from the board level all the way down and and have that very clear. And as you define the path, when that becomes clear, I think it's super important also to break it down into um, how to put it. Uh, I would say sizable pieces of work uh, in, in the sense that, you know, the way we used to run projects is you have this sort of 12 month project and that you have to deliver on and become sort of a huge piece you undertake, uh, with migration involved. And, and then it gets delayed, of course, inevitably, and then it runs over to 18 months, 24 months, and it becomes a problem internally. And, and, and it, it causes a lot of, of tensions within the organization and credibility issues as well. So I think it has to be broken down into very, very small chunks that, that you can handle and then have a test and learn approach and be agile in the way you're delivering things and sort of reorganize the way you're delivering things so that you can incrementally bring demonstrable improvements to, to your current situation and show that you're migrating towards that, that vision, but it doesn't have to be done everything in, 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 at once. And, and I think maybe the last thing about digital transformation and, and you know, sitting today on the, on the board of, of large organizations like Enda in Tunisia or, or you know, innovative microfinance institutions like PIMF in West Africa and Madagascar, for instance, but I'm also sitting on the board of some fintechs. Um, one thing you shouldn't underestimate, and I'm, I'm really putting a lot of emphasis on this, is the um, cultural change internally. Uh, I think it's a huge thing, um, and that's also where a lot of digital transformation projects don't succeed. Uh, there's a lot of efforts that need to be put around or put into communicating to the staff, getting their buy-in, but also skilling them and reskilling them and having a clear path for them because they are the ones at the end of the day who are going to be delivering, who are going to be part of your, your new self as you've digitally transformed. And if they don't see themselves in this, if they feel threatened, if they don't have a clear path in terms of the role they can play today and in the future, and there's no development plan for them to be part of that vision, then they're not going to be supporting the vision. And then you will have a lot of 
friction, you will have a lot of resistance. And I think it's really important to cater to that as well. So I would say, you know, it's it's important to have a strategy clear. It's important to to have a path that's that's something that's digestible and that you can deliver on uh, bit by bit, so that you can also demonstrate success at every stage, and that creates a lot of positive energy. Um, of course, the tech part, but I've already spoken about the tech part is important. But the cultural change piece is something that's extremely tricky. How do you create that culture of digital literacy of uh, innovation, of flexibility, of inquiry uh, within the teams is, is something that needs to be uh, to be addressed. Okay, well, let that be the takeaway, not underestimating cultural change. I mean, it's true, change management yeah. is absolutely key and, and it does have a lot of implications for the organization. Um, I, I also I wanted to touch on next, I guess you, you brought up um, super platforms, uh, particularly oh. around financial literacy, but um, you know, so that that's you know one aspect of their role. But is there um, maybe can can you talk about maybe the role of them that you've seen in financial inclusion, maybe aside from digital financial literacy, since we already hit on that, and also the low the impact on local innovation. Yeah. So you know the the thing about super platforms is that they're increasingly becoming providers and marketplaces for financial services. We see that happening uh, with N Financial, with WeChat. Uh, Facebook is now getting into this. I think they will really play a critical role in financial inclusion in the years ahead. Um, but frankly, um, I think I would like to see their role reaching way beyond just financial inclusion. Um, in today's world where we are concerned about major issues affecting the planet, um, like climate change and, and, and other topics, um, I think super platforms, because of the role they're they're playing, have a responsibility to society at large. And and you know if if we are going to let a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon shape um, our social and economic lives using artificial intelligence and other technologies, then they will have a responsibility to use these within a certain you know for the lack of a better word, I would say ethical framework that should encompass values that go just beyond profit. And, and I'm not implying that this is not the case today and they're not thinking about it, but I think if, if the process has started, it needs to be enhanced and it needs to be amplified uh, and we need more evidence that this is happening. And so for instance, I was mentioning, um, and I think I was mentioning and financial before, we see, we see fintechs in Asia to actually catch up with this notion of responsibility and impact. And then if you've heard of N Financial's uh, N Forest initiative, I find that initiative extremely exciting. And what they have done is they have created a game um, that you can play on your smartphone. And then, you know, depending on the choices you make um, when you pay things uh, using Alipay, uh, you pay for your transportation, you pay for goods and services, Depending on the choices you make, you earn points. If you're socially responsible, if you're decreasing your carbon footprint, for instance, you've used an electric vehicle to go to the uh, to the office, or you've walked to go to the office instead of using a, a regular car, for instance, if you've used the bus, so you're you're reducing your carbon footprint, you earn points. And based on the points that you earn, you can actually build in the game. You can actually plant a virtual tree in a virtual forest. And the more points you earn by being socially responsible, the more things you can do, the more trees you can plant. And in exchange of that, they actually plant a real tree in real life. And so if you've seen, cool. you see what they've done in the last year and a half, uh, they've onboarded 500 million users on the app and they've planted 120 million trees, uh, which is remarkable. So, you know, the only point I wanted to make about those super platforms is they, they have a role to play. It goes way beyond just financial inclusion. And they can then leverage and harness the, the audience they have and the millions of customers and users they have to go beyond financial inclusion and drive behavior. Uh, is that going to affect competition? I think you, you were asking me about impact on local, local competition. Local I don't think so. Yeah. Because the way they've designed their models and the way they've built their models, all of them is, is on an open model, open architecture. Um, okay. And so that allows space for creative entrepreneurs to actually bring in new services and connect to them and distribute these services. So on, on the contrary, I think they're supporting innovation. So it will stimulate local innovation. Yeah, definitely, definitely. 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I really like that example of, of in financial and, and actually changing the behavior um, through gamification. That's um, and, and then, you know, making the virtual doing actual re real, real acts um, as, as a result of the virtual activities. That's that's quite cool. Um, I guess, you know, to move from super, super platforms to the other side of, of um, you know, the other stakeholders in, in the ecosystem is kind of talking about now the role of multilaterals and the foundations um, that are, are very active in digital finance. So, you know, the the iffies and diffies of the world, the foundations like Bill and Melinda Gates, um, what do you believe their role is today and, and also maybe where you see their role in the future? Yeah, so we're working a lot with these multilaterals, um, I have my own opinion that I've formed through through years as well. Uh, I mean, I think they have an important role to play. Uh, first, in addressing some of the key issues of, of our time uh, around, you know, responsible finance, um, ethical lending. Now that we see the proliferation of nano credits and and all sorts of lending that are algorithmic uh, driven. Um, there, there's a lot of questions around, you know, ethical lending and sort of good code of conduct for the industry. Uh, there's, there's big questions around digital ex exclusion. I've mentioned that before. I think one of the big risks that we're facing today is that digital is going to increase inequalities instead of actually narrowing and, and bringing people uh, closer together. So I think there's, there's a lot of questions. There's a risk there. So and there's risks around data privacy, obviously, that we all, all know and we start to feel and we are not necessarily sure how to address them. And I think all these, these big topics, uh, including digital work, by the way, because now the digital economy that's built on the rails of digital finance is also allowing you to have digital work. You have Uber drivers, you have safe bodas in Africa, you have all these ride hailing services, whether car based or motorbike based, that are also proliferating. So there's questions around digital work. Is it decent work? Is there extortion or exploitation by super platforms of, of workers of the new digital age? And I think all of these big questions that are related to digital finance uh, at the heart have to be addressed. And I think there's probably a role that they can play now at, in that moment to address in addressing these issues and 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 in sort of creating that debate, shaping that debate at the industry level and trying to move these issues forward and, and drive uh, market consensus and, and, and positive change. So I think that would be one. I think they probably also have a role in, in guiding uh, DFS providers uh, through this journey and through the digital and digitalization journey and provide advisory services, financing, funding, allowing them to experiment new things by creating the space and providing resources for them to create new things. And I think also in ensuring that fintechs and other innovators um, that are building new services on top of these digital finance rails that we have established are building inclusive um, models. Because one of the risks as well is that fintechs could be focusing only on the on the on the top tier of the economic pyramid in any given country. If you're a fintech, you want to be successful in India, you don't need to go and in include the poor and serve the poor. You just need right. to launch your service in Delhi and Mumbai and you're, you're done. So there's that big question in terms of, yes, we see more and more digital innovation, but is that really going to drive inclusion? And is that really going to bring all the poor and the vulnerable of the world, of the world on board? And there's a risk that, again, it's going to increase inequalities if it's not properly addressed. And I think they can play a key role in supporting entrepreneurs to actually think through and design and deliver business models and innovations that are inclusive and specifically targeted at those segments that are the most vulnerable in society. And, and that's a role that I see multilater multilaterals um, could actually play pretty, uh, pretty powerfully. Well, that's a fair point. I mean, there's still plenty to be done there. We and as as you're saying, we want to make sure that we don't increase um, the inequality that that exists, but actually that there is somebody still focusing on focusing on the, the base of the pyramid um, and providing making sure that the solutions are being developed and provided to to that sector or segment rather. Um, well. As this is, um, I mean, always, I think there's many different things that, that we can touch on, but I, I realize the time, so I have to ask kind of maybe our, our, our final question and then open up to, to the audience. And sure. that is around um, your predictions for digital financial services within the next 10 years. Um, I mean, as you mentioned, kind of the, those three 
key technologies being you know the open apis machine learning and and, and what what we've already seen um, mobile able to create um i guess that that that's today but where do you see us in in 10 years um in digital financial services and and maybe we can touch base in 10 years again and see see what happens yeah so somehow i sense that your last question was going to be the most difficult one um and unfortunately i don't have a crystal ball so it's difficult to say what's going to happen in 10 years but i think i can probably draw on what's happening today and i think there's a few things um that we we can see i think first of all um i think there's a trend towards uh privatization of money in the sense that uh, more and more platforms uh, are going to be implementing their own wallets and their own payment schemes, uh, which in some cases might be cross-border, but there's going to be that sort of tendency for vertically integrated ecosystems and value chains to build their own uh, payments business and payment scheme and own, own wallet scheme. Um, so you're seeing that already happening with uh, Gojek um, in, in, in Asia and, and Grab in Asia, which are the two largest ride-hailing platforms in Southeast Asia that have this entire ecosystem of, of users and, and drivers and, and retail points where users can actually load their wallet and make purchases and drivers equally. Uh, and now they're building on all that data that's being generated to offer more value-added services to, to all these participants in that value chain. So you're seeing a lot of private, what I would like to call privatization of money in the sense that you're, you're shifting away from the notion of, of a nation state and everything happening within the borders of that state to actually allowing enterprises to run their own schemes and providing utility within their own ecosystems. Uh, and that could become cross-border. So you're seeing a lot of that happening. Um, I think the, the other thing that's happening is that you're seeing the new generation of leaders arriving, uh, the new teenagers of today. And I think they are going to be the ones re-architecting um, our financial system in a way. Um, we've all seen that there's a big shift towards software. Everything is becoming code. Uh, if you look at the biggest fintechs today, take the example of Stripe, for instance, which allows online merchants to, to actually collect online payments uh, very easily. And it's seven lines of code that you need to drop on your website and you can basically uh, acquire online payments very easily as a merchant. Uh, they were founded by two Irish brothers that are 19 and 21 when they founded the company eight years ago. And now the company is valued $35 billion, uh, which is 10% of JP Morgan's valuation. Um, if, I, if I remember correctly, I don't have JP Morgan's valuation in mind anymore, but I'm saying that that's that's the kind of stuff they build if then if you know how to code you can build those type of disruptive services in the world of tomorrow that's going to change completely the financial system architecture if you look at the blockchain space the founder of ethereum which is the second largest blockchain and i'm very much involved in in blockchain projects at the moment uh of different types the founder is vitalik buterin he was 21 years old when he started this so we're starting to see that this new generation of tech guys who know how to write code and, and proper code are able to completely transform um, the financial system. And we're going to see that happening more and more. And so, you know, as I was talking about the structure of the boards, maybe we need to think about getting some of these talents on, on, on our boards, by the way. And maybe the third thing I wanted to say is banks are not going to die. And, and I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, all these fintechs, all these innovations, mobile money providers, and and you know, there's that question of whether banks are going to die in the next 10 years and they're going to disappear. Um, I don't think it will happen because there's a, you know, see with, with banks, there is an element of trust um, that is super important. Um, super platforms are providing a range of services. They're providing, um, you know, personalized products. They're providing a certain convenience, a certain easiness around how you consume your services. Uh, but we know that when you, when our money is with the bank, it's protected. It's protected by regulations. It's protected because there's certain criteria they have to meet. And if anything happens and they disappear, the government is going to be taking care of that, which, which is a notion that we don't have right now with super platforms. So I think maybe my third prediction is, is beyond sort of, you know, the privatization of money and, and the rise of that new generation that, are, that is going to completely redefine the financial system of the future is that banks will still be around precisely because of that trust element. Now, their role might shrink completely to just being sort of the uh, custodian uh, if they're not good enough in their digital transformation journey. 
uh, but they're, they're going to remain, they're going to stay there. Uh, and then maybe I'll add a fourth one <laughs> to, to end that just came to mind right now as I was talking is that I think in the next 10 years, um, there will be one global currency emerging. Really? And probably okay. not one of the current currencies that we know, uh, but there will be, and Libra is the first step towards that. Uh, but I don't think Libra in its current model and current governance is going to be that. Um, I don't know what it's going to be, possibly an, an IMF-led currency, uh, but I think we need that in, in an age of digitalization and, and of the economy, yeah. uh, where information takes 0.1 second to move around the world, we need a single currency uh, for these integrated economies to function and to facilitate economic exchange and trade, then we will have a one single global currency uh, in the next 10 years. That that would be my predictions. And please don't ask me again in 10 years how wrong it was. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's quite cool. I, I, I mean, I think you, you broke it down very well. And um, and I, I'm really excited to see what, what of that actually comes true. I do want to make sure we have enough time for the questions that, that have popped up from, from the audience. So maybe I'll, I'll dive right into that. Um, Without without further ado, so one um, is back to the you know topic of digital transformation. What are the key considerations to decide if the new unit that's leading digital transformation should be kept separate or integrated within the within the business as usual unit? Um, I, I would say it's a question of capacity, right? I mean, and and it's. Um, I've worked with some DFS providers that have decided to actually build it as a separate business because they felt that running the existing business and the legacy business um, and, and building the, their new digital self at the same time was incompatible, both in terms of skills, in terms of structure, in terms of technology, um, and in terms of the, uh, the, the imperative of, of running that, that business on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you have to set up um, a separate team and you have to set up that separate structure that drives it and, and that's been happening uh, with most of the providers I've been working with. It's always been done by, by a, a separate team that's built a separate but they are tightly integrated and closely work together. Um, I don't know of any on, on the top of my head I don't remember any provider uh, that I've worked with that decided to do it completely internally exactly with the same teams as, as a natural sort of extension of their roles and responsibilities because it, it takes a different type of thinking, it takes a different type of uh, uh, operating model, it takes a different technology and technology can involve within the same IT department but in terms of the way you design your products and the way you think about your products, um, the way you you uh, think about uh, partnerships with fintechs uh, requires different types of resources. So I would say it's, it's not necessarily a technology, a separate technology department, uh, but very often the people that drive the thinking around partnerships and products and, and, and how you integrate these new technologies within our, our separate teams that think about that, but they're still closely working with the existing teams. Right, which is obviously going to help with the change management because you can't have them completely siloed as yeah. they, there needs to be yeah, I mean, there's, there's um, a risk. You know, yeah. ease into the change. There, there's a risk in having them completely siloed, not just a risk, an institutional risk, but there's also a risk of, of you know, making, creating frustration in your staff because then you have the people right. working on the next cool thing that are in the next building and they're doing the great stuff and you're doing the boring right. work and you don't want to create that. So you want them to be connected and work together, but you still want to have specific focus on these issues that require different kind of talents and skills, and, and then they can transfer the skills, as you said, uh, Charlene, to, to the rest of the team. So that helps right. with the uh, change management. Um, so so the next question um, and is around this, you, you mentioned before this paradigm shift from financial intermediation towards um, data intermediation. So, would would you wouldn't you say that we need to see more consolidation and standardization in the fintech space? Uh, there's a couple of questions here, um, so maybe we'll start with that um, around consolidation and standardization in fintech space. Yeah, so I mean, consolidation is going to happen inevitably. Uh, every fintech that's built is is built on the premise that at some point it's going to be bought by someone else, uh, a large bank or or another large player. So consolidation will inevitably happen. 
um, in terms of, of standardization, I would say yes, to, to a certain extent, and, and it's already happening. If you look at, for instance, um, GDPR uh, and, and, and PSD2 in particular, not GDPR, but PSD2 and all the, the regulations around open banking, and there's different countries taking different stance, uh, but there's, there's more and more standardization around uh, you know, how do you need to open your interfaces, uh, what kind of API specifications of these APIs. So in the case of the UK, for instance, the specifications have went all the way down to not just define sort of the legal framework and, and the operating framework, but the, the, they've done the detailed technical specifications of, of the APIs uh, as they should be designed in your systems as a bank or as a fintech. Uh, that's not the case in the EU, that we don't have the technical specifications, and in other markets that's not the case as well. But there's, there's now more and more need to standardize how data is going to be used, how data is going to be exchanged between systems and platforms, and define rules around that interconnection between these systems, and define standards also around consumer protection, and that's work that's in progress. Um, but it's, it's, it's progressing really quickly and we are already starting to see a lot of things. So yes, there will be increasing standardization to define how all of this interoperates in a way that's uh, protecting all the parties involved, um, the core platforms on which the fintechs are built, um, the digital rail providers, but the fintechs themselves and of course the consumers. So we, we are going to see more and more standardization definitely around data and, and data interfaces. All right, um, and there are some follow-up questions, but we can maybe ad address those offline and, and respond to those. I want to make sure we have enough time for some other questions. So um, there's one around, how do you see the credit bureau's role in the fintech space? So there's, I mean, obviously the credit bureaus need to evolve. Um, they need to evolve and they need to, you know, one of the big challenges is also capacity building um, within the credit bureaus. And there's a lot of questions around how do you have the regulators sort of, you know, follow the pace of innovation. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done in that space as well. And there's specialized um, organizations that actually tackle that and train regulators. But I think that the credit bureaus have a, have a challenge today in terms of making sure first that they integrate all this nano lending uh, trend within their framework so that, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's reporting not just on traditional credit, but also on digital credit. Um, that's already happening. And then how can they modernize their infrastructure? And there's, there's a project that comes to mind, which is a Kiva project in Sierra Leone, where they're actually building a digital uh, identity platform and a digital credit bureau uh, on blockchain for the, the state of Sierra Leone. And one of the things that's happening there is now that credit bureau is going to be holding both your digital identity uh, but also all the digital claims that are related to your credit history, whether it was disbursement related or payment related in one place as part of your identity so that one, you own your identity and you own your credit history and you own your, your, your history of interaction with financial institutions and then you're able to share it as you like with other institutions for them to provide services to you. So I think there's, there's that shift that's needed on the part of credit bureau to take into account uh, the digital age and, and the new digital business models and be able to capture information from them within their repository. But there's also another shift, which is giving you as the user back the ownership, ownership um, right. of that data history now uh, so that you can actually use it to, to access more services from more providers. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's really, you're seeing that, that shift in, in the ownership of data, which um, having credit bureaus um, be accepting to that is, is is going to be quite interesting to see how how that's adopted elsewhere as well. Um, so I'm going to the last question, which is um, which I find to be quite interesting. There's there's many more, but maybe we can address those offline to the individuals. Is why is it so difficult for developed countries, for example, the U.S., Australia, and Europe, to get into mobile payments um, and more flexible platforms that you that you might see in African countries? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really legacy um, legacy systems, and and in the U.S. in particular, love for cash. Everybody loves the the the, the green note, um, and and they want to get the the the, the money in the, the the money in the local economy in the U.S. is actually circulating in cash. Uh, people want to get their tips in cash. They get that's that's the way it works. But I think it's mm -hmm. legacy systems, um, and and to be able to move away from the existing legacy payments infrastructure to a new kind of infrastructure 
that works across all the providers and all the institutions that are involved in this national payment system, which requires obviously um, adoption on the part of all of these institutions of, of these technologies, and it requires standardization and interoperability rules and all that stuff is, is a huge task. Um, and that's why it's taking time. Um, maybe the ones that could drive this agenda faster are the likes of um, Apple, uh, the likes of Amazon, because they have a sufficiently large audience in these markets to be able to shift, um, at least as far as payments are concerned, the existing payment mechanisms to, to their own private mechanism, and they could actually do that. You could have an Apple wallet, and you already have an Apple wallet, in fact, um, that in, to a certain extent uh, disintermediates the traditional sort of payment um, vehicles. Uh, and instruments uh, that could be pushed even further. But on the other hand, uh, they don't want to completely harm the banks that are also potentially funding their business and, and fueling their growth to a certain extent. So there's there's that fine balance that's happening right now. Uh, and and it's not, you cannot replace completely uh, overnight the existing infrastructure and the existing sort of balance uh, within the payment systems. Um, so that's, that's really difficult. I think in Sub-Saharan Africa, it was easier in the sense that there was a huge gap in the existing payments infrastructure. And it was the same in China, by the way, and, and Alibaba, Alipay, and then Financial, and, and the likes of WeBank and others have actually um, leveraged that to build a new system um, that's digital and that, that works. I think in those markets, there's that transition that's needed from legacy to new that's taking a bit longer. Uh, it's cultural. Yeah, you're really able to, to leapfrog. It's, it's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, that's all the time we have. Um, as this is always, um, you know, really interesting. I feel like we could spend a lot more time. Um, so thank you for for the time that you were able to give us and for joining thank us you. and and answering all these challenging questions. Um, and um, just the the next digital financial deep dive that we'll have is is going to be on December uh, in early December. Um, but the questions that we've, we've that the additional questions that we've had today, we'll, we'll post those um, in addition to to the recording of this webinar, so that all of the the questions that we have are answered. Yeah, I mean, I'm totally happy to uh, to take questions offline as well and and address some of these. I know that you know we we didn't have all the time uh, to, to to take all the questions, and I'm sure there's a lot of interesting conversations to be to be had. So, thanks a lot for for the invitation. Thank you, um, everyone, for for joining us. And um, yeah, uh, please don't hesitate, Charlene, to pass on additional questions, and I'll I'll provide a, a written response to them or at least some thoughts. Um, yes. Yeah. All right, well, with pleasure. Okay, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.